The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Rheumatology, Immunology, and Immuno-Oncology Intersect. Navigating the complexities of immune checkpoint inhibition, autoimmunity, and immune-related adverse events. How can rheumatologists help minimize the risks and maximize the benefits of cancer immunotherapies? Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash GQF. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Len Calabres. I'm professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine and director of the R.J. Faisenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology here in the Department of Rheumatic and Immunologic Diseases at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome to this educational activity which will focus on cancer immunotherapies, immune-related adverse events, and why it's important for rheumatology professionals to have a good grasp of these topics. Joining me in this discussion is Dr. Evan Lipson. He's Associate Professor of Oncology at the Johns Hopkins Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center in Baltimore. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. So uh, let's get started. Uh, we're really here to talk about this intersection of immuno-oncology and rheumatology, but uh, I think as everyone who's uh, watching this knows that the, at a very high altitude, this is just one small but very important piece of a really a, a, a new area of medicine, uh, a new uh, area of nosology, uh, of diseases that uh, might seem very similar to a lot of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, but we really don't know what their nature is. We don't have very much information on the immunopathogenesis. Um, they have been referred to as the potential Achilles heel of uh, immunotherapy, uh, yet at the same time, um, they, uh, for the most part, can be manageable, and we think that uh, uh, rheumatologists have a major role to play because rheumatologists, as a profession, uh, we're the only group that actually specializes in the diagnosis and management of multi-system auto-inflammatory and autoimmune disease. So we're, we're, we're really eager to throw in here. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And I think with the revolution in cancer immunotherapy has come a cross-discipline need for management of these patients. And as you mentioned, rheumatologists are particularly well-suited to care for these patients because of the immunological underpinnings that inflame parts of the body that we'll talk about today. And uh, just uh, parenthetically add, uh, you know, we have uh, lived and developed the largest armamentarium of targeted therapies for these type of diseases, and we hope to bring the skill set to this. So um, let's let's take this in order, and um, I'm going to pass the baton to you. And uh, you know, immunotherapy is not a new concept in oncology. That's right. Uh, yet. Uh, you know, all of a sudden it is everywhere. Can you give us kind of the, you know, magic minute on how we got from yeah, yeah, there to here? It's a, it's a long story. And uh, I think just in the last probably 10 years has it, so, so, so to speak, come of age. But it started back in the 1800s. Uh, most people would say that William Coley was sort of the father of cancer immunotherapy. <clears throat> and the story goes that he was a surgeon in New York and he cared for a patient with uh, a tumor in the head and neck. This patient uh, eventually was uh, brought to the operating room for resection of the tumor, developed a very high fever as a result of this infection. And as it turned out, the immunoactivation that occurred as a result of the infection not only vanquished the infection, but also uh, vanquished the tumor, it seems. And this, uh, this patient did well for several years thereafter. And so this was Coley's first insight into the power of the immune system to fight tumors. And he spent most of his career uh, trying to capitalize on, on those observations. So years later, after this first demonstration by Coley that uh, this sort of vaccination, quote unquote, could be effective, um, more and uh, varied types of cancer immunotherapies were developed for various types of malignancies, et cetera. Uh, the timeline uh, that's on the screen right now, I want to just uh, bring your attention to one of the medicines that was approved in 1992. It's a high-dose IL-2, interleukin-2. 
And the reason that's a turning point in immunotherapy is because that was one of the first drugs that we were able to demonstrably show again and again to have a long-term immuno, um, uh, immuno effect on the, on the tumor. So there are patients out there with renal cell carcinoma and melanoma who were treated 20 plus years ago and who still have anti-tumor responses, still have no evidence of disease. That's, it's, it's a low percentage of patients. It's only probably 10 or fewer percent of patients, but the, the principle at that point was proved that by ramping up the immune system in a particular way, you could, in fact, bring about durable, long-term anti-tumor responses. So fast forward to 2011, and that's when the first immune checkpoint inhibitor was approved by the FDA. So this was anti-CTLA-4, or uh, the drug is called ipilimumab. So ipilimumab is a medication um, that is um, used in a few tumor types uh, these days, but there too, this was sort of the proof of principle that a drug that targeted a regulatory molecule on T cells could bring about long-lasting anti-tumor responses. And there too, we now have survival data for patients that were treated 10, 15 years ago with anti-CTLA-4 for melanoma. They're still alive today without evidence of, of disease. And uh, that brings us to the anti-PD-1 era. So anti-PD-1 was uh, tested in a, a first-in-human study um, in 2007, 2008, it was a study that uh, Hopkins was a part of. Hopkins uh, led up a, a portion of that study. And um, here, too, we saw the proof of principle that anti-PD-1 therapy could be effective against multiple tumor types and that we began to see long-term anti-cancer control. Um, and most recently, uh, doctors Allison and Hanjo, uh, the discoverers of, of CTLA-4 and PD-1, won the Nobel Prize um, for their discoveries. And so uh, this is, of course, a story that's still being written, but the power of the immune system is sort of clear now uh, that we can see anti-tumor responses in multiple tumor types using immune checkpoint therapy. So the number of tumor types for which these therapies are effective uh, seems to grow by the month or the year. I, I have a slide that is constantly out of date on this. And That's right. I, I can't keep this up. That's right. This, the, the sooner you add the, the next uh, indication, the sooner the FDA approves uh, the, uh, an additional one. So this really has become an additional pillar of cancer therapy, immunotherapy. And I think that, as I said before, because this spans so many tumor types and is being rolled out uh, across such a wide swath of the cancer population, um, we're, um, we're using these drugs uh, nationally and internationally in a larger and larger number of patients. And because of that, uh, we're collaborating with specialists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, et cetera, et cetera, to help patients who experience the side effects, the immune-mediated side effects of these therapies. We uh, uh, have a kind of a tradition in uh, uh, rheumatology uh, uh, academic conferences uh, of the people uh, from your group and our group and other groups who go around, we usually do a, ask for a show of hands, like who has seen uh, uh, IRAE so mm -hmm. far? And you know, it started from you know a couple people to now it's generally over half the population right. of uh, clinicians, and uh, it's only going to get more. To your point, oftentimes a cancer drug is approved for a particular malignancy, and it doesn't the activity of that medicine doesn't really span outside of that particular tumor type. Immune checkpoint therapy is common denominator therapy, as it's been called, and because of that, it works for multiple tumor types. And so your statistic um, is, um, is just sort of a testament to how ubiquitous these drugs have become because they effectively treat percentages of patients with multiple tumor types. T tell us a little bit about how these drugs work. Uh, you know, I know this is a, a, a field that uh, people spend their lives in, but uh, in a few minutes, just kind of give us a, a practical sure. understanding. So I think the best way to explain this probably is the what we, how we explain this to patients. And that's if you picture a T cell floating around the body, the T cell's job is to understand what is normal and what is foreign. And foreign things include bacteria and viruses and cancers. The regulatory molecules that help the T cells decide whether to go ahead and attack or to back off are these immune checkpoints that we're talking about. So the T cell really requires two 
molecular stimuli to go ahead and attack what's in front of it. The first is the T cell receptor meeting up with its ligand, and the second uh, is a signal from uh, one of the regulatory molecules that we're talking about. So that's uh, commonly referred to as signal one, the T cell receptor, and then signal two. Those are great names, by the way. Signal one and two. So, yes, yeah, so I can right? remember those. Yeah. Easy to remember. So uh, signal one and signal two have to happen for the T cell to become activated. And there are various flavors of these. Um, I think for purposes of explaining for today, it helps to think about them in, uh, in sequence. The first happens in the lymphoid tissue, in the lymph node, for example. And then the second happens in the periphery, in the tumor microenvironment. And so for the two classes of drugs that we're going to discuss today, CTLA-4 inhibitors and then PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, those um, act respectively in general in the lymphoid tissue and then in the periphery at the site of the tumor. So CTLA-4, as I said before, is a negative regulator of uh, T cell stimulation. Blocking CTLA-4 inhibits that inhibition and by sort of pulling the parking brake off of the T cell, you allow it to go forward and attack. The same is true with PD-1 and PD-L1. Those two are negative regulators of T cell activation. By blocking that handshake, that molecular handshake between the T cell and the tumor cell or antigen presenting cell, uh, you allow the T cell to go forward and attack what's in front of it. Sometimes um, what is in front of it is the tumor itself and therefore you have an anti-tumor response whereby the T cell is activated against tumor tissue. Unfortunately, some of the side effects of these medications, as we'll talk about later, arise from the stimulation of populations of T cells that are targeted against normal tissues, so collateral damage of normal tissues joints, skin, lung, kidney, liver, you name it. So there is a menu, um, a wide menu of, of uh, regulatory, immunoregulatory uh, molecules. Over and above the CTLA-4, PD-1. Yes, CTLA-4, PD-1, and PD-L1 are just the ones that have been most extensively researched. Uh, but TIM-3 and GITR and CD-137 and LAG-3, and there's a whole alphabet soup of them. Uh, and so many of these uh, are being targeted by blocking antibodies that are in clinical trials now, uh, sometimes in combination with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1. And I, I would just add to that, that in addition to um, targeting this expanded array of negative checkpoints, there are also uh, positive stimulatory nodes uh, within the uh, T-cell antigen-presenting axis and so there are uh, clinical trials combining immunoenhancing uh, signals with checkpoint uh, inhibitors, and uh, this is really, you know, potentially uh, much more potent, but also uh, could be, you know, a Pandora's box. And uh, you know, those of us that have been around uh, a while ago, it was only uh, a short decade ago that the TGN experiment of uh, looking for a, uh, a antibody that would only uh, uh, target regulatory T cells had untoward immunoenhancement and all these patients in the proof of uh, concept study uh, developed cytokine storm. So uh, right. cautionary tales. Yes, for sure. But you're absolutely right. We can block the inhibitors, which are CTLA-4 and PD-1 and LAG-3. You can also agonize the activating uh, uh, molecular pathways, so CD-137 and OX-40, et cetera. Okay. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, as we said before, seem to be uh, garnering approvals from the FDA. Um, as the years uh, go by, the list is now uh, seven drugs long. Um, ipilimumab is the only approved molecule that targets CTLA-4. Uh, there are uh, three uh, drugs now targeting PD-1, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and semiplumab. And then there are three that target PD-L1, atezolizumab, avelumab, and dervalumab. And then, of course, these are being uh, trialed or, in some cases, approved, uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab. In, um, in combination uh, for, for some malignancies. And some of these, com and, and when you uh, uh, combine these, uh, that uh, has been clearly demonstrated to enhance toxicity That's potential. That's right, yeah, ex exactly right. You, you probably up the efficacy in terms of anti-tumor response in some cases. Uh, for sure, the, the risk of a serious toxicity goes up, uh, no doubt about it.
So, as I said before, the list of tumors uh, that are being treated these days with immune checkpoint inhibitors is quite long. Uh, lung cancer, kidney cancer, urothelial cancer, uh, liver cancer, gastric cancer, squamous cell of the head and neck, the microsatellite, you know, in unstable tumors we talked about, cervical melanoma, of course, uh, Merkel cell carcinoma, recently cutaneous squamous cell, cementlamab was approved for cutaneous Longer and longer. Cell. The list goes on. Hodgkin lymphoma, primary me mediastinal large B cell lymphoma, uh, and I say, as they say, the list will get longer, no doubt. So I think it's safe to say that um, no matter where you are, um, and uh, certainly in Western medicine, uh, that in your community, these drugs are now being utilized to treat patients with cancer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been a game changer for not only academic centers, but as you said before, for community oncologists who have now incorporated these drugs into their armamentarium. Part of the reason for that, as I said before, is the durability of these responses. And so we're seeing some patients that are several years out, five, six, seven, eight years out, who still have long-term survival. And so the curve that's on the screen now uh, is a, a demonstration of just that, that concept. So this is an overall survival curve uh, looking at patients with metastatic melanoma who were treated with either a combination of ipilimumab plus nivolumab, that's the top curve, or nivolumab by itself or ipilimumab by itself. And the percentages that survive uh, up until this point aren't, aren't so much what's important. It's more the plateau that we're seeing form on, on the, uh, each of the curves. And uh, this just speaks to the long-term survival um, that uh, we've seen in other studies uh, that, as I said before, can go on for 10 or 15 or more years. So just to, you know, for us non-oncologists, and for the general public who's trying to process this, you know, this, there, there's a tremendous amount of excitement uh, surrounding these molecules. Uh, but this is not a, quote, pan cure for cancer by any means. Yet at the same time, you know, there are a subpopulation of patients with these tumors that are long-term survivors. And this is, uh, this is you know, extraordinarily valuable. Um, uh, in, in your armamentarium. You're exactly right. For some patients it works really well and it works for a long period of time, but there are certainly a large percentage of patients for whom it does not work or for whom it works in very short order and then stops working. So maybe this is a good time to segue into the discussion of autoimmunity, which as I said before, are these off-target effects of Im uh, immune checkpoint therapies that uh, wind up inflaming parts of the body that it, uh, we did not intend. You know, it's, it's an incredible story. And, uh, you know, if you just kind of back this up for a second, um, I think uh, teleologically, if you think about checkpoints and neutralizing checkpoints to immunoenhance, the question should be, why do we have these checkpoints? And, uh, you know, they're not just merely mindless breaks on the immune system. They're there for a purpose. And I like to explain this to people by saying that, you know, under ordinary circumstances, when you get a cold or a flu, your immune system, you know, ramps up. And within a week, one T cell becomes a million T cells. And as the cold and flu virus disappears, as we vanquish it, um, the immune system returns to immunologic homeostasis. In situations like cancer or chronic viral infections like HIV, that is not the case, and you can't get rid of this antigen. And what happens is that these checkpoints actually serve to create a, 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 a state of immunologic detente where um, the immune system is still working at this cancer, but the immune response isn't killing the host. And so that's very vital. So because these are important immunoregulatory nodes, uh, there's been a lot of work going into asking the question, well, if these things can, you know, uh, uh, tone down the immune system, um, or if they're defective, lead to an upregulation of the immune response, are they actually involved in the pathogenesis of inflammatory diseases? Maybe this is the mechanism uh, of, for some of our diseases. And there's two lines of reasoning uh, that have been supportive of that. First of all, we have a, a, a lot of uh, basic science work, preclinical animal models. So if you take that CTLA-4 and you knock it out of a, a, a mouse, it dies, uh, fulminant death, uh, auto-inflammatory, end organ uh, uh, involvement, uh, a very severe disease. PD-1, on the other hand, a little more subtle, and depending upon the strain, that also develops a, a, an autoimmune, auto-inflammatory disease. But in one mouse, it might look like lupus. In another mouse, it might look like type 1 diabetes. 
Um, it, it can affect uh, the progression of experimental multiple sclerosis. So there's a lot of information there to suggest that, um, you know, the diseases that rheumatologists take care of, we're actually, you know, uh, living in a space uh, where checkpoint biology is, is uh, probably a lot more important than we have thought because uh, we've been focused on the periphery and the effector mechanisms. That brings us to uh, the question of uh, what is the evidence in, in man of these checkpoints? And there's two um, uh, areas of, of great uh, interest, and I'll just, I'll just mention them uh, uh, quickly. First, uh, the area of primary immunodeficiency diseases has grown from leaps and bounds. When I was beginning my training, you could count them on, on both of your hands. Now there's over 350 monogenic defects uh, uh, affecting virtually every uh, pathway that we know of. And one of them is CTLA-4. And there are uh, two well-defined uh, syndromes. Um, one is called CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. Uh, we, we refer to it uh, 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 the acronym is CHI syndrome, uh, which I like. Uh, and the other is LERBA deficiency, um, uh, and we call that LATTE. Um, and so CHI and LATTE. CHI and LATTE. That's like signal one and that's signal two. So it, it helps us to yeah. uh, capture these things. In both of these situations, uh, what happens is that the T cells have a half of a tank of CTLA-4 on their surface. And what happens? They develop autoimmunity. They can get arthritis, pneumonitis, cerebritis, um, uh, hepatitis, and beyond. So we know that by compromising CTLA-4, um, uh, it can lead to inflammatory disease. Now the new horizon is to investigate these in um, uh, the pathogenesis of um, autoimmune diseases, and in particular, uh, two have been looked at in, in great detail. One is rheumatoid arthritis, and instead of CTLA-4, these appear to be defects of PD-1 pathway. And so within the rheumatoid inflamed joint, um, where there is a hyperexpression of PD-1 uh, on infiltrating lymphocytes, what has been demonstrated is that, number one, there is a deficit of PD-L1 ligand. So that checkpoint is not clicking. You know, there's, there's nothing there to trigger it off. Um, and actually some very uh, uh, clever work has been done by looking at a, uh, um, uh, a gene signature uh, extracted from patients who were actually, uh, that had renal cell carcinoma, uh, treated with uh, PD-1-directed therapy, and using that uh, gene signature to interrogate uh, synovial tissues from patients with osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and other forms of arthritis. And it, what uh, uh, has been demonstrated uh, is that rheumatoid patients uh, demonstrate a highly homologous genetic uh, signature, actually looking at how these genes are expressing themselves, looking at the transcriptome, uh, very similar to patients getting um, uh, anti-PD-1 uh, or anti-PD-L1 therapy mm -hmm. in the context of cancer. Um, another uh, chapter of this is giant cell arteritis, a disease of uh, older individuals where uh, Dr. Connie Wayand and her group at Stanford have demonstrated that the dendritic cells uh, within the temporal arteries, um, is, which is anatomically where we believe this disease starts in the adventitia, uh, they have a deficit of expressing PDL1. And uh, she has an experimental mouse model, can exacerbate it with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, let me summarize a great deal of work by saying for rheumatologists and immunologists, um, uh, we are already uh, engaged in checkpoint biology dealing with our own diseases. So now I think that we can uh, turn um, and uh, uh, talk about uh, what we're really here to, to address today, uh, which is uh, the complications uh, that can ensue uh, in the wake of checkpoint therapy. So can you give us a little bit of introduction? You're an oncologist. You've been using these drugs uh, now since the beginning. Um, you know, how do you wrap this, uh, your head around this? Well, it's a good question because the IRAEs, as they're called, the immune-related adverse events, can affect any organ system. Uh, that's not an, an exaggeration. Uh, and they, they can mirror um, rheumatic diseases or other inflammatory diseases. And so you have to be uh, quite 
careful when a patient calls with a particular symptom that you're not just sort of brushing aside what will turn out to be a, a serious inflammatory response. Um, so what we see in um, the rheumatic uh, sort of framework in patients commonly are um, patients that have been on immune checkpoint therapy for a few months and they'll come in one day and they say, I, I can't make a fist, I can't close my hands. Or they'll say, I'm a 40-year-old patient and I feel like I'm 80 because my knees are creaking and I, you know, it takes me an hour to get moving in the morning now and I've never had this before. Uh, or for example, they'll come in and they'll say, just last week my mouth got so dry that I can't eat a pretzel without taking a sip of water after every bite. And so as an oncologist, you really, your, your, your radar has to really be sensitive to understanding that what you're seeing is not just sort of a, you know, some sort, some, something to be brushed aside, but in fact is, is an inflammatory disorder that needs to be addressed and quickly and oftentimes in conjunction with our rheumatology colleagues. So before we uh, actually dig into some of these uh, uh, rheumatic things uh, 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 individually, what about uh, just uh, to give us a, a flavor of, of, of the oncologist, um, other organ systems. Are, are there actually any organ systems that are spared from IRAs? <laughs> it's hard to think of one. Uh, there really are not. And we tell patients, no matter how, how small the symptom, don't hesitate to call us because we want to know if um, a particular area is being inflamed. We want to know that early. Uh, so a little bit of nausea, a little bit of diarrhea, we want to get on that quickly. This could be immune-mediated gastritis or enteritis or colitis. Um, the liver gets inflamed, uh, the skin gets inflamed, the joints get inflamed, the pituitary gland gets inflamed. Uh, there really is uh, sort of no, no area of the body that's exempt. There's a figure that I, I, I frequently quote. Um, in the pre-checkpoint era, autoimmune hypophysitis was among the rarest of syndromes, poorly understood, and had uh, an incidence that was calculated at one in seven million people. And there's right. a, a paper there. Yeah. And on high-dose uh, IPI, uh, I, I, 10, 15 percent plus? Uh... You're exactly right. And we're seeing this not just with hypophysitis, but with a lot of disorders that before this were quite rare in the general population. But now with the advent of uh, you know, T cell activating therapy, we're seeing phenotypically anyway syndromes that mimic what we know to be autoimmune hypophysitis or nephritis or what have you. So patients often ask, what is the likelihood that I'm going to end up with a serious toxicity, or as we say in the business, a grade three or a grade four toxicity? Tell, me, tell the, uh, our listeners uh, and viewers what uh, grade three, grade four, well, grade two means. The, uh, officially, we generally use what are called the CTCAE, the Common Toxicity Criteria for uh, adverse events. And this is something that's put out by the NCI. It's easily available online, but it divides um, multiple toxicities and symptoms and such into five categories, grades one through five. Grade one is mild, two is more severe. Grades three and four we generally consider to be the uh, sort of in the severe category and then grade five is death because of the toxicity. Grade three and four might get you in the hospital, right? It may, yeah. Grade three and four certainly makes us um, uh, want to address the symptoms uh, very rapidly for sure. And oftentimes that does mean hospital admission. So. The patients ask, what's the likelihood that I'm going to end up with a severe toxicity, a serious toxicity? And it looks like about 15% of patients, maybe 10, maybe 20, depending on the study that you look at, with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 monotherapy wind up with a serious toxicity. So those are reasonable odds. That means that about 80% or 85% or something in that, in that general range of patients will end up with minimal to no toxicity. So I think patients generally are willing to take a risk like that uh, of a serious event rate of about 15 or 20 percent. Considering that they have metastatic malignancy. That's right. And, uh... That's right. When you start adding drugs in combination, so for example, anti-CTLA-4 plus anti-PD-1, the likelihood of a serious toxicity goes up above 50 percent, maybe 55 percent or so. And uh, there, too, I think patients realize that sometimes they only have a single shot on goal, so to speak. They really need aggressive therapy. So one of the other questions that patients uh, ask is, when am I at risk of these toxicities? Is it right as I'm getting the dose? Do I have to wait three months? Is it after I've finished with therapy? And the answer to that question is yes. It's, it is as soon as you get the first dose of therapy, a patient is at risk of an adverse event. We've had 
uh, a case of pneumonitis that occurred within 12 hours of, uh, of the infusion of the first dose. We have also had, and this is particularly true of rheumatic AEs, but we've had uh, patients that have been off of therapy for a year or more and wind delayed. up. Yeah, a delayed uh, adverse event. Their last dose of therapy was a year ago, and just now they're coming into clinic complaining of what turns out to be an immune-mediated uh, arthritis or what have you. So perhaps we can focus now on some of the rheumatic AEs and talk about what you've seen in your clinic and how do we yeah. go about evaluating these folks. All right, so, well, I, as with any organ system, and if uh, you, you could substitute any subspecialist in, in my seat here, the, there's an expanding story, and it's a, it's a, a complex story. So um, I, I'll point out that there have been uh, many uh, 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 systemic, uh, systematic and narrative reviews on this and uh, we've recently uh, published one with uh, uh, Laura Capelli, one of your uh, colleagues at uh, Hopkins and uh, uh, Cassandra Calabrese uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so I would uh, 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 shout this out as a, 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 a recent up-to-date review, for, at least for the next month or so. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens after that. So let's kind of drill into this and, and, and ask the question why. So here's a, um, uh, a really interesting uh, perspective uh, of this, and this is an abstract uh, uh, derived from a, an abstract that uh, we uh, are in the process of uh, submitting. But uh, you, know, you don't have to be a statistician to see that uh, if you look at the cumulative number of reported cases per, per year, and this is just rheumatic IRAEs, is going up exponentially. And um, uh, similarly, the literature on this, uh, unfortunately, is about 95 to 97 percent clinical descriptive uh, right now. So, you know, the, the, the serious questions of uh, immunopathogenesis and uh, looking for anything in terms of controlled trials or treatment for this it, it just does not exist right now. Yet at the same time, there is an urgent need um, to come to grips with these uh, patients who have these disorders and, uh, 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 and, and try to uh, help them uh, maintain their uh, cancer therapies. So this is a, a really interesting uh, drawing, and uh, it basically shows that um, uh, on the y-axis is uh, the proportion of patients who have um, different uh, uh, complications. And you can see the more common things that you're talking about, including uh, uh, skin, colitis, hepatitis, uh, seen in palpable numbers of patients. Uh, we live in this long tail of IRAEs, and uh, I think that it is safe to say that s significant rheumatic uh, IRAEs are seen in uh, about 4 to 5 percent, um, plus minus uh, a little bit. So one out of 20 patients uh, may have these complications. In and around uh, uh, our complications are a wide variety of, of kind of... Uh, disorders of unclear idiopathogenesis that are multi-system. And we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about myositis uh, 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 later on, but patients with myositis just don't have myositis. They have things that look like myasthenia gravis and myocarditis and axon loss polyneuropathy. And uh, uh, there are Sjogren's-like patients who have uh, uh, CNS involvement and pneumonitis. Uh, so um, it is... Uh, uh, small numerically, but when you aggregate them, uh, this is a formidable group of patients that we need to deal with. Uh, let me kind of give a high altitude uh, summary of some of the major uh, rheumatic uh, signs, symptoms, and entities that uh, we're dealing with and uh, see what uh, uh, our mutual experience uh, might uh, lend to this conversation. The first thing I'd like to say is that when rheumatology uh, first came into this. We were not the first uh, group uh, present because, uh, uh, as I said, uh, three, four, five percent, whatever it is, we're on the tail of this. So uh, for the early experience with IRAEs, you guys were battling uh, colitis and hepatitis and later uh, pneumonitis and, and beyond. So it was kind of under the radar screen. So if we, the, the question that was uh, asked was that, well, how often are rheumatic uh, adverse events seen in clinical trials? Because by uh, the approval time of all these drugs, there was a formidable database of this. And uh, 
Uh, this is uh, data from uh, uh, a very nice review by uh, Laura Capelli, who asked that question um, several years ago and came up with this remarkable uh, and clarion insight is that, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, uh, rheumatic signs and symptoms and entities were poorly captured in the clinical trial uh, database. And if we just look at uh, asking, how often do you see arthralgia? Looking at the same drug and the same tumors, the range is uh, range from 1% to 40%. And uh, I, you know, I, I feel your pain as a non-rheumatologist, literally and figuratively. Um, you know, patients who are going through the worst time in their life, uh, who are on uh, big time therapies, um, uh, having aches and pains is not uncommon. Uh, for a non-rheumatologist to divine that this is a, a clear rheumatic syndrome, yeah, sure, joints swollen, tender, can't pick up the coffee cup, but you know, I'm having a little aches and pains in my back and my neck. Is this just some kind of, you know, fibromyalgia, disuse, uh, inactivity? Um, that's right. That's right. Do and you in empathize fact, with this? absolutely. And in fact, even on a per provider basis, I think it takes most of us a little bit of time to become familiar with these and some pattern recognition to sort of set in. And so, by the time we've seen our hundredth patient, we can say, oh, you know what? That arthritis, that joint pain, that dry mouth, that whatever it is, is something I've now seen a few times, and it's it's beginning to register as an immune-related adverse event. But before you see that, you're right. Your 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 sort of your instinct is to say, well, you know, cancer patients have all sorts of aches and pains, and and they and they do, and they, you know, and and uh, rheumatologists are very sensitive uh, to this. Uh, and I've seen a lot of patients who have had fibromyalgia, central pain amplification. I mean, you know, they're not sleeping well. Uh, they're undergoing, you know, tremendous life stresses. Right. Uh, they're not exercising. These are all cofactors that go into that. But um, you know, it may, it's it's made me just kind of think here. I said this this is a um, really kind of a stress test for oncologists. You guys are having to up your internal medicine game like <laughs> hugely. Uh, uh, in, the, in the wake of this. That's true. I will say too, and this is to the patient's benefit, it has really helped uh, the cross-disciplinary uh, management of patients. You know, as they say in the business, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, w one of the, the great advantages of being at a large academic center like Hopkins is that we're able to refer patients to subspecialty clinics and get the opinions of specialists about how to manage these you know, intricately complex adverse events in ways that we would not have thought of as oncologists. Yeah, and I, I think that you know, interprofessional collaboration is, is, is uh, good for a, a lot of diseases, but this is uh, you know, kind of like the poster child yeah. is right now. Yeah. So at any rate, from the uh, clinical trials perspective, the information was not granular, uh, showed that it was being poorly captured, but over time, um, uh, patients would present with dramatic uh, a a adverse events, and there have been uh, a number of studies uh, that have collectively given us a view of uh, inflammatory arthritis, uh, which the rheumatologists, we immediately understand what that is. This is something that is more than arthralgia. It's more than an ache and pain in the joint. It's associated with some type of physical sign, whether it be joint tenderness, joint swelling, often attended by early morning stiffness. Um, all the things that, that we recognize. And this has been uh, reported uh, variably between this kind of 1% and 5% range. Um, and uh, uh, when it's prospectively looked at, uh, the figures are, are, are slightly higher. There's a small subset of these polyarthritis patients that are of great interest to the rheumatologist. Uh, uh, Belker and colleagues uh, from Paris a few years ago reported for the first time that uh, a number of these patients, a small number, uh, were ACPA positive, just like a rheumatoid. And uh, they had no history of uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, before getting a checkpoint inhibitor. They developed polyarthritis and then had this test uh, performed and it was positive. In a few of these patients, uh, because they were involved in clinical trials, there were banked uh, serum. And several of them had uh, pre-treatment uh, ACPA positivity. And uh, rheumatology speak, we call that asymptomatic autoimmunity. And um, you know, approaching a percent of the population uh, may have these type of autoantibodies. We subsequently uh, confirmed that, and I know uh, other groups, including yours, have also seen small numbers of these patients. And the commonality of this is, is that these patients appear to be the early uh, IRAE onset patients. 
uh, and that probably in the big uh, pathogenesis of rheumatoid where you have genetically predisposed to full-blown disease, these people were working their way there, had asymptomatic autoantibody, and then enter checkpoint inhibition and explosive disease. Right. And uh, we've seen, you know, anecdotally, a few patients that, you know, after uh, first or second infusion became totally incapacitated. Right. Totally incapacitated. Um, uh, 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 an onset that is very peculiar for uh, rheumatic diseases, which um, uh, even when they're chronic, tend to be more insidious. And you know, this is a typical risk-benefit discussion that we have frequently with patients who are known to have some sort of autoimmune disorder at baseline. So a patient who, for example, has been on immunosuppressive medications for a history of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, comes in with metastatic cancer and needs immune checkpoint therapy. And so the conversation revolves around what are the risks of using the immune checkpoint therapy? What are the benefits? Might I exacerbate the underlying autoimmune condition? The answer to that is you may. Uh, in some cases, we have not seen that. In some cases, the administration of anti-PD-1 and somebody with, for example, underlying rheumatoid arthritis has not exacerbated the RA, but in other cases, it certainly has. And this spans a, a, a large population of people, so... 25 million. <laughs> at least, <laughs> and, and if you add on to that, the, the number of patients that have other immune disorders, so for example, solid organ transplants. This is, this is a group that's now coming into focus. These were patients excluded from previous trials of immune checkpoint blockers. So what happens when you give somebody who has had, say, a kidney transplant an immune uh, checkpoint blocker? What happens to the allograft? What happens to the cancer itself? These are difficult discussions. Sure. I mean, all of those patients were censored from clinical trials. So now we're learning in real time right. and uh, trying to cobble together retrospective and small studies. Uh, a very important question. Polymyalgia rheumatica would be particularly uh, challenging, I think, to the oncologist because, you know, uh, people over the age of 50 have a lot of aches and pains. We've talked about all the predisposing factors, but PMR is actually one of the more common syndromes and uh, um, all rheumatologists can recognize this. Um, we've recently put together a, 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 a multi-center series of PMR and have systematically reviewed this literature. And it appears about three out of four patients who have been reported as PMR would fit uh, what we have as we call them ACR ULAR classification criteria. Yet about one in four are atypical. Their acute phase reactions aren't very high. Uh, you give them 15 milligrams of prednisone, they kind of laugh it off. Uh, this is things that make us very uneasy, and we recognize right now because this is a disease that has no diagnostic test to it. It's a clinical constellation of symptoms. So we would say that patients who are um, receiving checkpoint inhibitors who have um, the acute or subacute onset of diffuse myalgia with morning stiffness uh, warrant to consideration for this diagnosis. Absolutely, and that that uh, the, the terminology we often use is a a PMR like syndrome or a yes, non Barre like apt. syndrome because phenotypically it looks like PMR or phenotypically it looks like Guillain Barre, but in fact on a molecular basis it's probably a little bit different. And that brings us to pr probably one of the most challenging IRAEs. Uh, that there is, and this is the spectrum of myositis. And uh, 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 myositis, and uh, right uh, just uh, as I was coming over here uh, today, uh, 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 Dr. Cassandra Calabrese told me that we have a ventilator myositis patient in the hospital mm. right now, uh, IRAE, uh, very complicated. So myositis, uh, uh, we have a group of rheumatic, uh, idiopathic, inflammatory um, uh, uh, myositis syndromes that we've known about for a long time. Uh, we have treatments for them. We understand the pathogenesis to a certain degree. In the wake of uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy, there is a new entity. Um, and while there is myositis with elevated CK and weakness, it's often associated with several other features that we just are not used to seeing. Uh, one is the uh, uh, presence of bulbar symptoms, of dysphagia, um, uh, ocular motor uh, symptoms that look myasthenia-like, and some actually may be myasthenia, but others are totally antibody negative and have negative uh, repetitive nerve stimulation. Um, and then a, a smaller portion 
um, who actually have cardiac myositis, which now turns out to be among the most fatal of all the IRAEs. That's right, um, and not just only, uh, not, uh, the, the, the challenge here is not just that the, that the syndrome is so global, but we don't really understand yet how to target what is the offending uh, molecule in the body and how to reverse the process. And so some of these for sure are T-cell mediated and uh, in a percentage of ca uh, cases using a, a T-cell modifier. So for example, prednisone uh, goes a long way to turning these syndromes around. But in other cases, uh, what's going on in large part is antibody driven. And there, in those cases, you need IVIG or some other antibody driven uh, meat, uh, it brings us, therapy. just to, to, to kind of embellish this uh, myositis syndrome, so any of these three compartments of uh, myasthenia, uh, skeletal muscle myositis or carditis can occur individually, they can occur all together. Um, they are virtually always devoid of pathogenic autoantibodies, our so-called myositis profiles uh, of antibodies are, are virtually always negative. Uh, we have very scant data on pathology. Less than 50% of them are pathologically documented because I think we know that these are terminal patients. They have myositis. So we're, we're, we're working at a deficit. Absolutely, yeah. Just to, uh, closing this out, there are many other syndromes associated. Vasculitis can be small vessel vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis. There are now small numbers of cases uh, of uh, scleroderma-like syndromes, Raynaud's, digital necrosis. Um, sarcoidosis that may involve just skin or lung or systematic. Um, Sarcoid, uh, I will say, is particularly confounding for the oncology uh, folks because when we see adenopathy in a patient with cancer, our first instinct oftentimes is to say this is progression of disease. And so uh, we, we just have to be really cognizant that in some cases you can biopsy these these growing lymph nodes and show that there are non caseating granulomas that's sort of a sarcoid-like reaction and what they don't need is more cancer therapy, what they need is corticosteroids. Or... Yeah, so the diagnostic and treatment approach to these patients uh, is quite complex. Uh, oftentimes an IRAE ends up being a diagnosis of exclusion. You certainly have to consider all of the other possibilities. Uh, so uh, the cancer itself can often be the offender. Um, that can be a, uh, a result of adjustments in other medications. So as an example, we had a patient come in a few years ago with bad diarrhea after having received ipilimumab plus nivolumab for metastatic melanoma. It turns out that it wasn't the ipi plus nevo, but in fact his primary care physician had increased his dose of metformin for his diabetes. And that, that drug's uh, side effects include diarrhea. In fact, that's, that was the culprit. Uh, infections can often cause some of the symptoms that we're talking about. So an inflamed joint does not always have to be an IRAE. It can be a an arthritis from, you know, septic arthritis. Or a MET. Or a MET, for sure. You've certainly seen that. Yep, absolutely. And so <clears throat> we're cautious um, to consider the possibility that it is not the cancer therapy. But once you've done that, if you've uh, reasonably excluded everything else, it does become uh, an immune-related adverse event sort of by exclusion. So we clearly don't have time to talk about a therapeutic algorithm, but can you give, give us a, a just kind of a, a summary of how uh, you know most people approach these? And uh, I, and I will say, uh, 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 and I'm very uh, glad to say that for the first time uh, since the introduction of uh, checkpoint inhibitors, um, that several oncology organizations have uh, at last in 2018 actually included. Um, uh, rheumatic complications um, in their treatment guidelines. And we uh, have uh, several uh, on the um, slides that you can uh, yeah. look at for, for more reference. Yeah, and as we've all become more aware of them, it's become clear that they're more common than we thought. And I agree that it's, uh, it's becoming more and more part of our sort of uh, uh, the vocabulary of the, of the IRAEs. So I think in general, uh, clinicians think about IRAEs in three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. And as I said before, they are officially graded by the CTCAE, uh, but I think it, clinically it helps us to think about them in those three sort of simple categories. So for example, a mild AE might be a patient who comes in with um, a, uh, a, a, an oligoarticular or maybe a monoarticular arthritis that really isn't impacting daily life and it's just a little bit of achiness in the morning and with some movement things get better and that's, that's all there is. Maybe uh, some NSAIDs or something that help throughout the day, but it's nothing that you need to interrupt therapy for and it's nothing that needs more than just some supportive sort of over-the-counter care.
A grade two or a moderate toxicity is when things begin to impact the daily life of a patient. And as I said, there are official criteria for these sorts of things, but a lot, a lot of it's done by feel. And so a polyarticular or monoarticular arthritis where a patient really can't comfortably get up in the morning or they, they really can't grasp a, a coffee cup in the morning because their joints are so stiff and hurt so much, you know, that's something that, that really needs to be taken seriously. Um, a, because the patient's quality of life is affected, but also B, because this can escalate into a serious grade three or grade four toxicity. So often when somebody comes in with a moderate level toxicity, we'll hold the therapy. Uh, we're, 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 we have a very low threshold to hold the therapy. These antibodies stick around in the body for long periods of time, and so to, to skip a dose is not a big deal. And we'll oftentimes try some supportive therapies or send them to endocrinology or rheumatology or what have you to try to get them assessed. Uh, and once we've gotten things back under control, back to a grade one, for example, oftentimes then we can restart their cancer immunotherapy. When somebody comes in with a severe toxicity, uh, it's, it's a, little bit, um, uh, a little bit trickier to handle oftentimes. A, because time can really be of the essence. And so patients that present, for example, with a grade three colitis, we've had patients where if you, you know, wait too long to report, they end up with a necrotic colon and, a, you know, needs to be resected, et cetera, et cetera. So um, getting on top of these patients rapidly is, is really important. In the world of rheumatology, in somebody with a grade three toxicity where the joints just really are um, severely affected and the quality of life is affected and mobility is affected, uh, that's something that needs immediate uh, evaluation by a rheumatologist. And in those cases, oftentimes, we really do have to stop uh, sometimes permanently the, uh, the, the cancer immunotherapy. And so in patients with a life-threatening rheumatologic AE, um, a life-threatening myocarditis, for example, we really cannot safely restart those therapies. And the, the, uh, the, the, the next line of therapy in these grade threes is generally glucocorticoids. Yes, that's true. So let's just uh, take uh, about a, 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 a case uh, to just pose a, a real-life thing before we close. So it's a 62-year-old uh, man who had uh, 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 stage four renal cell cancer had undergone uh, a lot of therapies um, and was put on checkpoint inhibitors, combined therapy, uh, PD-1 anti-CTLA-4 protocol for four uh, cycles. Developed pneumonitis and uh, diverticulitis uh, that was problematic, uh, was hospitalized, uh, treated uh, with whatever standard of care was, and that seemed to settle down. He had a history of osteoarthritis, um, uh, and uh, also had a history of spinal metastasis, so making it a little more complicated here. You got bone pain, you have this history of a MET. And then uh, after getting um, anti-PD-1 therapy um, uh, in October of 2018, notice something changed. Um, uh, finger, wrist, elbow, pain and swelling, uh, bilateral shoulder pain, a lot of stiffness, uh, particularly in the morning, uh, felt terrible. Um, uh, uh, w w where would you be going with this right now? This is a great case. So the symptoms worsened significantly is something that we tell patients to be on the lookout for. So patients know themselves well, right? And they know what they feel like when they get up in the morning and they know what sort of a typical day feels like in terms of mobility and what they can do, et cetera. And so, at the first sign that things had, had changed, we would ask that this patient get in touch with us right away because clearly there has been some sort of change, right? There has been some modification on a molecular basis in the body that has brought about these significantly worsened symptoms. And so we would ask that they call us right away and we would bring them into clinic and assess just the sorts of things that you described. So, uh you know, that's, it, it's very interesting, and, and I've heard this comment from oncologists, um, that they would like to refer this to a rheumatologist, you, you know, whether you're in the iconic setting where you've got this team working, uh, but majority of people getting these drugs are not uh, in tertiary, quaternary centers. And so part of the challenge is, is A, finding a rheumatologist who actually knows about this, right? I mean, you know, why should I refer to somebody that... It's clueless. Right. And, and two, facilitating access. And uh, I will tell you that uh, 
Uh, I've been uh, part of uh, the, the uh, uh, ULAR uh, guidelines committee on IRAEs, uh, and we hope to have our guidelines uh, by uh, summer of 2019. And I I'm hoping to see one of the basic operating uh, uh, principles of these guidelines is that uh, prompt referral and prompt access uh, is needed. And uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm making that to our, to our, our audience. So it, this patient was seen by a rheumatologist, and there's a lot of synovitis, a lot of this uh, shoulder pain that was very uh, present on uh, active abduction, um, not much in the lower extremities, had uh, significantly elevated acute phase reactants, CRP, and sed rate, but was totally serolo serologically negative for everything, but had a sister with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatologist suggested 15 milligrams of prednisone, Quote, best I felt in two years, no pain. The goal here is not to just treat the arthritis, get them back to the hands of the oncologist. So they started tapering, and with the taper, which is seen so often, is a, a worsening of these um, uh, 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 symptoms, uh, uh, but not to a, a palpable effect. Um, still doing pretty good. Checkpoint inhibitors restarted, boom. Um, worsening of the symptoms. So now, kind of stuck with this. Uh, I can control it with 15 of prednisone, but if you get the checkpoint inhibitor again, it's pretty bad. What will you be happy with for me to do to this right. patient to give you, to continue this therapy? We, we are seemingly tugging at, at the opposite ends of the same rope, right? In some ways, we are immunosuppressing this patient because of the symptoms you described, and in other ways, we're helping his, his T cells to attack cancer, and so how do you sort of navigate that? So m most of the clinical trials that, uh, that tested immune checkpoint therapies in these patients accepted a level of prednisone that was approximately 10 milligrams of prednisone per day in, a, in an average patient. I said that's a magic dose. It, it's, it's a made-up dose is what that is. Okay. If, <laughs> Thank you. But, but, but <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because most of us, I think, are, are pretty comfortable using the medications, using anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1, et cetera, in these patients who are on about 10 milligrams of prednisone sure. because we have reasonable evidence from these trials that the, that the medications can work at that level. When you get beyond 10 or maybe 15 milligrams of prednisone per day, then you're into territory where we really have not investigated the efficacy in an ongoing fashion of whether continued use of the anti-PD-1 drug is really going to have effect over and above what you've already seen with corticosteroid doses that high. So just to, to, to wrap this up, uh, you know, depending on how severe, how compromised the activities of daily living is, et cetera, you know, this must be the conversation that I would want to have uh, with you as we kind of craft this. So this interprofessional uh, dialogue is, is critical. And there is in the literature some uh, evidence that uh, some of these patients can be maintained on fairly low doses of methotrexate, and that might be okay. You know, the role of uh, antimalarials and sulfasalazine, uh, we, we have very little uh, idea on it. But, you know, uh, there are patients uh, that uh, take two biologics uh, and you know we're not uh, we haven't arrived at, at this yet but uh, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done moving forward. So There is, and in fact, it's a good point you bring up, which is that patients often come in with underlying immune uh, uh, syndromes, and rheumatoid arthritis or what have you, and they're already on a biologic. So for example, I have an elderly patient with metastatic melanoma who's been on leflunamide now for several years, and it's done a good job of controlling his RA. And so when we started therapy for him, we asked his, his uh, rheumatologist, what do you think we should do with the leflunamide? And we, of course, have zero evidence to go on uh, for patients like this. So we decided to continue his leflunamide at a low dose to try to sort of prevent the severe worsening of sure. his RA. Turns out this worked. He had a very nice anti-tumor response with IPI plus Nevo, and his rheumatoid arthritis really has not flared to any sort of degree. So the reason this is important is because what we know now from, from cases just like this one is that you can have a low level of immunosuppression on board, but still get a good anti-tumor response with anti-PD-1. So hitting that sweet spot really is the, uh, the, the work that's got to be done in the future. More work to come. That's right. So let's, uh, let's end this by uh, addressing some unanswerable questions. Um, you know, uh, it would be pretty incredible if uh, we had great biomarkers to predict all these things. And uh, 
there's a, uh, let me just summarize by saying there's a lot of exciting work going on in this space, uh, but there has been no home run hit with this. And um, That's right. And so biomarkers are uh, certainly an important and active area of research right now. Um, the occurrence of an IRAE is in some retrospective studies, um, it does correlate with patients that have had a nice anti-tumor response. Does that mean that everybody who has a nice anti-tumor response needs to have an adverse event? No. We all have patients who have had essentially nothing in the way of toxicity and have had a wonderful anti-tumor response. Does it mean that every patient who gets a bad IRAE is going to have a, a nice anti-tumor response? Also no. We've had patients with terrible side effects who have had nothing in the way of anti-cancer properties of the drug. Uh, excellent point, and, and uh, we always have that discussion with patients when they're dealing with these IRAEs. Uh, we've already touched upon the fact that there's at least 25 million people in this country with varying forms of autoimmune disease, and uh, we just don't have a lot of answers right now for them of how robust their candidacy will, will be, but certainly uh, I, I, I know that um, uh, uh, most centers and most oncologists are taking these patients on. And the point that I would like to make, and I know that you'll agree with me, is that I think these are excellent patients to be co-managed right from the get-go. You know, Indeed. if you have a patient with rheumatoid and you want to see them, I want to see them before they get their checkpoint inhibitor and follow this along so there's no surprises and we can work together. Yeah, absolutely. And then back to your question a moment ago about restarting immunotherapy. So there are patients out there who have had wonderful anti-tumor responses to therapy and have had some grade 3 or grade 4 side effect that has required we've stopped the anti-PD-1 or CTLA-4 or what have you, and they've needed immunosuppressive therapy, infliximab or steroids or something else, but they have never needed additional anti-cancer therapy. Uh, the analogy I make with patients is it's sort of like taking a grocery shopping cart and pushing it down a hill. You only need to shove it once and then it careens down the hill at, uh, you know, without any, any, any further pushing. And it, it does not happen certainly in everybody, but in some cases we never have to restart the, I shouldn't say never, we don't for the, the time that I've been treating these patients, have to restart the anti-cancer therapy. And we just say this to patients because they understandably get nervous that they won't ever be able to restart or continue their therapy, but sometimes you don't need it. Well, we've covered a lot of territory here and uh, uh, it's been a great discussion. Um, let me, let me kind of close with just uh, some summary points that, you know, as I said, I think we're at the beginning at the beginning of this. I think rheumatologists have a, a lot to offer. Um, I, would, I would like to uh, um, uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, Xavier Marietta, uh, who has uh, written with me uh, some editorial comments about the evolving role of rheumatology, and I, I, I think you've reinforced this. I think that uh, we have a lot to offer. Um, not only in just the, the micromanagement of this tail of the IRAE uh, complication group, uh, but our, uh, our, our, our knowledge and skills in targeted therapies of autoimmune and autoinflammatory uh, uh, diseases, uh, I think can be of value uh, moving ahead here. To my colleagues um, uh, uh, out there who are watching this, um, this is a difficult literature to keep up with, but there's uh, increasing amounts of educational opportunities at uh, national and international meetings. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, us in uh, tertiary care centers who are very happy to be resources uh, in managing these patients. Um, and that over time, um, I guarantee you, uh, whoever uh, is uh, uh, listening to this, uh, that these patients will arrive in the practice. Yeah, no doubt. No Any doubt. closing comment for Just us? Just to say that uh, you know the, the relationships you talk about across disciplines have really been instrumental at Hopkins. I work closely with Laura Capelli and Bing Bingham at, at, in rheumatology at Hopkins, and we have really developed a nice working relationship where patients get easily passed back and forth, and we really do co-manage patients who are dealing with some of the inflammatory issues we discussed today. And so I really encourage uh, physicians, not just at tertiary centers, but in the community as well, to develop these relationships where you can easily send patients back and forth and co-manage them. Excellent. Hey, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I uh, hope you found this discussion informative and useful to your practice. Thank you. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening.
Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash GQF. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb.